Hethman Kura is the director of the JCP and the Java community at, community at Oracle. She oversees the jcp.org website, technology development, community building, events, marketing, communications, and growth of the membership. In 2016, Heather served as leader of the effort to broaden JCP membership to be more inclusive. Heather is passionate about Java, women in technology, and developer communities. Today, she'll be speaking about how to bridge the gender divide in technology. Please join me in welcoming Heather. All right, thank you, Frank. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks for having me. So why today am I wearing pink? Is it because I'm a woman? Do all women like pink? And do all developers look like this, wearing glasses? Or do they look like this? Does my appearance change my skills? But does it change the way you perceive my skills? and my abilities. Something to think about. Technology reflects the people who make it. And today, most technology is designed by men. Yet, women make up 52% of the worldwide population. If you look at women and men and who's working at technology jobs, currently the number of women in science and technology jobs is at about 20%. And women at the same time make approximately 78 cents for every dollar that a man earns when they do those jobs. So despite the fact that it's proven, teams that include both men and women, not just men and not just women, are smarter, more innovative, more collaborative, and actually have greater return on investment for their shareholders. So the latest McKinsey study actually estimates that bridging the digital divide and bringing more women into science and technology jobs could increase gross domestic product by trillions of dollars. That is pretty astounding. So not only can we create solutions using technology that are going to benefit the entire society as a whole, not just one portion of society, but we can actually better the economy by bringing more women into science and technology fields. So, she who is brave is free. And I say this because actually some of the research these days does prove that women and minorities who talk about diversity in tech actually are penalized. They're penalized in terms of their perceptions by their peers and superiors, not just on their character, but on the actually work that they produce, so their actual skills. However, Men, particularly white men, do not receive this penalty in their, their skills perception. So we have a tremendous opportunity here uh, to enable men to act as allies to really solve this problem of bridging the digital divide and bringing more women into te technology without any type of um, penalization for doing that. So really it's a win-win. Now, um, as it was talked about earlier, I've worked in tech in the Silicon Valley for over 15 years. And that's one of the most common questions I get and why I recently started talking about this subject. So the most common question I get as I travel around the world as an international speaker, we're working with the Java developer community um, all over the world, is what can I do to get more women involved in technology? I would really like to work with more women. So I decided to put this talk together, which is what can men do? And women can act as allies too, but primarily I'm working in a technology space with Java developers around the world and at most times of the conferences I go to, I'm working with 95% men. Uh, so when I first started in tech, I'll tell you a little bit about my journey until I get, before I get into my top 10 ways to ally. Um, I really thought that tech was a meritocracy, that working hard was all that it took. So I put my head down and to be completely honest, I was oblivious to the fact that I really was one of the only women. So I worked this way for about five years and some of the feedback that I got was that, um, 
my behavior um, was not as effective as it could be. And when I, when I sat down and, and took a look at my behavior, what I realized was that I was mirroring the behavior of the people around me, which was predominantly men. And this behavior was not working for me. So working hard was, was not really doing everything that it could be. And I started to realize that if I wanted to be successful in tech, working hard was going to get me absolutely nowhere. I needed to bring my A game every single day and be absolutely phenomenal at my job to succeed, but I also needed to manage perceptions about my behavior from the people around me, and I needed to increase my influence, and I needed to expand my visibility beyond just putting my head down and working. And in order to do that, what I needed to have was sponsors, mentors, and allies. And I was fortunate enough to be able to have this um, and in my career. And so I feel I'm, I'm have, having this privileged position that I have succeeded as a woman working in tech. It's imperative that I share with the community some of the things that I think could enable more participation by more women in tech and really bridging that divide that we see all across the world in terms of um, men and women working in technology. So. Today, there are lots of things that we could talk about, about you know, what we can do to focus on getting more girls um, to be interested in tech and what women could do to change their behavior. But today, what I'm going to talk about um, is what we can do to ally and focusing on how we can do that, not how women should change their behavior or how we could teach coding to girls, which I'm also a part of. But today for this talk, we'll focus on what are the top ways to ally to get more women into tech. So what can you do specifically? So I put together 10 things um, that will walk you through each of those things. And the top thing to do is to think of ally as a verb not a noun, not a thing that you are, but a thing that you do sometimes. So if you think about the word ally, it's to join, to unite, to support. So think of this as something that you're actually going to physically do sometimes. You are going to ally. Second, be open. So we all know that talking about the subjects of gender, sex, uh, race, um, discrimination is all uncomfortable and there's an intersectionality to all of these things. They all kind of relate together as we talk about diversity in tech. So I recognize that it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for me and it's probably uncomfortable for most everyone. But what I want to do is create a space a safe space where we can be open and recognize the fact that we'll all make mistakes and it's okay to try some of these things, especially keeping in mind that everyone is going to make mistakes. But if you just try to be simple and direct and kind in your responses, you're going to find that you can actually make a significant difference. Be aware. This is one of the things that you can do when you're doing your work or when you're at a conference, be aware of how the assignments are being distributed. So if you take a look at tasks in the workplace, you're going to have housework and then you're going to have the real work. And this applies to any industry, but particularly in tech, you'll see the housework being managing projects. So that's typically seen as the housework where the real work is owning and writing the code. So be aware of the fact that not only the housework tasks like cleaning up the kitchen or organizing the conference room or scheduling a party in terms of thinking about distributing the work amongst different members of your team, but actually think about the types of tasks that are work, managing projects versus owning and writing the code and making sure that you see a balance in those types of tasks. Often what you see is that w work that women are doing, if you look at the ga wage gap, um, when women do a task, it is often perceived as less valuable. But it, in order to kind of level that playing field, you need to look at and ensure that the assignment distribution is equal. Create a friendly environment. So 
if you've done any research on the topic of women in tech, you've probably heard the term the, the, about the pipeline. So as I mentioned to earlier when I did my introduction talking about the pipeline, that's bringing girls into technology, getting them to study it um, through high school, getting them into undergraduate degrees and graduate degrees in computer science. So that's the pipeline, building that up and getting girls in. But the other problem that we have is a, called a leaky pipeline, which is that 47% of the women who do take tech jobs ultimately leave within 10 years. So that's a very leaky pipeline. So what can we do to actually retain these women who do decide to get into the tech field and have these um, roles in a technology environment to actually keep them? So what you often hear uh, women complain about when it, as it relates to leaving the technology field is the programmer culture. So that's kind of what I had earlier. You know, I have, I have a hoodie, I have my hat, I have my sunglasses. So if you don't fit that stereotype of the programmer, you feel like maybe you don't fit in. And I see this often at conferences too, being one of the only women speakers. Um, for me, it doesn't make me uncomfortable, but often I'll have women come up to me and ask me how it makes me feel. They would not feel comfortable stepping into this role feeling like they don't fit in. So what you can do is create a friendly environment. When you're in those situations where you see someone who looks like they're really not fitting in or you think they feel a little bit uncomfortable, look for ways that you can flock together with them. So they say birds of a feather flock together. So ask them questions about their work. Um, look for a way that you can connect with them as as a person. Try not to compare them to the other women in your life, but actually try to connect with them as, an, as a person and find their interests. What are they interested in and what are they working on? What are they passionate about in their work? Speak up. So you can do this uh, action item in many types of situations. You can do this in meetings at work. Um, many people now, especially in tech, are working in forums. So you can do this in the online forums. You can do it if you're attending conferences like Bill here today or other technology um, or um, conferences related to your work. Often when you see this um, type of thing that could be speak, spoken up about, it's, it's casual sexism. So this is something that you can speak up against when you see that type of situation happening. But also things like when you have a woman making a suggestion and not being heard by the rest of the team, if it's in person or on a same thing on a forum. So you'll see a woman make a suggestion. For whatever reason, she's not being heard, whether um, it's intentional or not. Um, no response, no reaction, and then often you'll see someone else make the same suggestion and claiming the credit for that idea. So that's a situation where you could definitely speak up if you recognize this happening. And it has been proven that many people actually do not hear the tones of voice that some women project. So it's actually a scientific thing, and stepping in is not necessarily going to be offensive to someone. They may not even realize that someone just made the suggestion and it was ignored. So stepping in and, and giving that credit can make a significant difference for the woman who's speaking up and feeling like she's not being heard or being ignored. So the other thing that you'll see sometimes in person is interrupting. And that's another you know, classic example where someone may be intentional in interrupting or not, but it's a situation where you can speak up and ask to allow the person who is speaking to finish. Um, number six. Intervene. So this is analogous to um, speaking up, but intervene is where it's a little bit more of, you know, a, a extreme, uncomfortable, inappropriate situation. So this is something where definitely you can help and make a difference by intervening and changing the subject. So this could be something, you know, sexual in nature, which often comes up at conferences, especially when there's alcohol involved. If you've been at any conferences where that happens, it happens quite often. I personally can't share any anecdotes about it, but I've been given antidotes by others. So I know that it happens. Um, so it's, it's particularly difficult for women to, um, to be talking about um, sex in work-related situations, just because oftentimes, they're really, if you think about it, is not an appropriate amount of sex for a woman to be having because she's either perceived as frigid if she's not talking about sex or she's a slut if they're talking about having her many you know, situations. So it's really 
best to just avoid that time kind of conversation. And if you if you hear things coming up that you think someone's uncomfortable about, just change the change the subject and intervene. Character trait assignment is number seven. So be aware of character traits that are oftentimes attributed to negatively to women. So there are many types of character traits and if you've been following Twitter, you've probably seen some of these coming up. So words to describe women's behavior that are not necessarily used to describe men's behavior. So things like bossy, um, abrasive, cold, uh, aggressive. So many Many times you'll actually hear these traits discussed when, for a woman in this kind of negative way. So just be aware of the fact when you hear des descriptions of women's behavior, just kind of be aware of that and filter it out. So I can speak from my own experience earlier when I talked about beginning my career where some of the feedback that I received from my mentors and sponsors was that I was um, perceived as a little bit bossy uh, or aggressive and sometimes abrasive, where when I think about it myself, I saw myself as a strong leader, independent, um, you know, taking, taking the lead, being brave. So it's just, there's two different ways that you can think about those types of behaviors. So um, as someone who's in the work environment working with women, it's something that you can do is be aware of that and filter it out. And there's a particular study that talks about this character criticism because where it often comes up is, yes, sometimes in that informal conversation where you're describing behaviors of people that you work with, but it also comes up in performance reviews. So particularly if you're a manager and have people working for you, be aware of this um, description of behavior. They've done studies where they've shown that the word abrasive comes up time and time again in describing women's behavior, but it very seldom comes up for men in their performance reviews. Um, so just be aware of these types of descriptions and character trait. Number eight, level the playing field. So one of the things that we can do to try to um, bring some equality and equity in the workplace and a balance is to encourage norms. So this again is especially important when you're looking at hiring and promoting within your organization. So you wanna to try to level the playing field. And by doing that, you can encourage norms that some women find uncomfortable. Research has shown that many women find behaviors that are necessary in most technology environments to succeed, such as self-promotion and negotiation. These are tasks that many women do not feel comfortable taking on as behavior traits. So if we can do something to encourage these behaviors, in all of the people across the organization, you can make a big impact. So some of the ways that I've seen people do this is by actually um, mandating that you negotiate your salary. So this is something that is going to be done. You need to make it clear. It's kind of an implied thing in most corporate situations. It's implied that you're gonna negotiate your salary but it's not stated anywhere. It's never been stated to me that I need to negotiate my salary. But the fact is that if you don't negotiate your salary, you are gonna be paid less. So we need to normalize this behavior so everyone is doing it in order to see that wage gap decreased. And the same thing for self-promotion. Time and time again, when I'm acting as a mentor for women in technology within my, my role at Oracle, um, women do not want to put themselves up for a job. They want to be told that they should go for that job. They will not put themselves up for the job unless they have all of the requirements that are listed in the job description. Where a man will apply if they have two of those skills, maybe even one, and they figure they can learn it while they're on the job. Where you see a woman wanting to make sure every single thing on the list is checked off before they'll even apply or promote themselves for that. So you need to, to normalize that as a behavior that you can apply even if you don't have all of these requirements. Really make that something that is going to be commonplace and a behavior that's expected and encouraged. Educate yourself about unconscious bias. Now, unconscious bias is something that we all have. 
everyone, every sex, every um, gender, every race has bias. We all have unconscious bias. It's part of being human. We try to pattern match and put things into categories that fit within our brain. So one of the things that we can do to minimize this is educate ourselves on tools that we have to recognize it when it's happening to us. So what I found really helpful as regards to unconscious bias is of course training courses, which I've taken taken some online, but also you can do it just as a day-to-day -day part of your behavior. So when you see something happening or you're upset about something or you're criti critical of something, actually stop and share what you're upset about with someone else. So take the opportunity to step back from the situation and share it with someone else. And when you share, focus not on how you feel about the situation, but what has actually physically happened. So what skills are being demonstrated, what has actually physically happened. Happened. Not your description of the person or how, what you think happened, but what actually happened. And see if you can stop yourself and recognize any patterns there where you might be unconsciously biased in this situation. Um, so for instance, for me, um, I do have women reporting to me and sometimes I'll make assumptions about them that I think they're going to be similar to me. So kind of what I talked about earlier, you know, when you're trying to find things in common with people and flocking together and look for that, connect that connection, um, try not to compare that person to people that you think they are similar to based on you know just what you perceive visually or what you know about them but try to connect with them as, as an actual person and not assume that oh because this person has just had a child they probably don't want to travel right now something like that so that's an assumption that's based on unconscious bias um, so it, it's not intentional, it just happens to be the case that you may know someone who just had a child, maybe it's your partner just had a child and they don't wanna travel right now. And so they want to later, but not now. So you're assuming that my employee now has had a child and maybe I'm assuming that that person feels the same way because there's something similar about them. So that's one, one example where you can see it happening and, and I've, I've actually run into myself a couple times because this was actually a surprise to me that I could have unconscious bias because I think I'm a very open-minded person but the fact is that you know it, it comes up for everyone the uh, last top 10 way to ally for women so suggest women so you know we need to support and encourage women as speakers and as leaders in organizations so I've been fortunate enough to have this and I am invited to speak around the world and I do participate on panels here you can see me in a panels with 20 something other men um, so it's it's um, really important if you see women out there that you think would be great to actually encourage them. So invite them to participate in conferences, in panels, to run up for that job promotion. And if, if, you, are, if you are a frequent speaker and you receive many invitations, actually suggest that woman that you know of. Or if you don't know of any, maybe suggest, ask who's on the panel and see if maybe they could get some more diversity in the panel. Um, if you don't know of someone, you know, you can just make that uh, general suggestion. It would be nice if we could find someone who would make the panel a little bit more diverse. So that's definitely something that you can do to help support and encourage that um, diversity in um, conferences and at panels and to have speakers and attendees also that are diverse, that um, represent a mix of society, not just one portion of society or one portion of the industry. And oftentimes this is just something that goes unrecognized. So it's not something that you should assume people are always thinking about. So if you are, you should definitely speak up and make that suggestion. So the last thing I want to say is you are here listening to my talk and I think that makes you awesome. Um, just remember that you will make mistakes and you may get some criticism, but that's okay. You won't always get praise. You will sometimes be criticized, but that's okay. If we keep moving forward, we can be effective in decreasing the digital divide. So what you can do is remember that we are all human. We are more similar than we are different 
and we can all be the change that we wish to see if we focus on people as individuals and focus on what brings us together rather than what divides us. And we can achieve the goal of gender parity in tech by taking these small steps day by day. That concludes my top 10 talk. I definitely would like to hear some feedback from the audience or take questions because I think we have a few moments um, before the next session. You can follow me on Twitter at HeatherVC if you want to tweet to me. And um, today I'm also tweeting from the Bill Twitter handle. So Bill Kampf, uh, follow the tweets there. I'm tweeting about all other speakers I hear from today. Um, thank you again for coming to my talk. I appreciate your attendance and for trying to make a difference and caring about this cause. <laughs> I've got a question. Okay. Um, in my discussions with my wife, one of the things that comes up uh, in her pursuing work is when she sees a listing of qualifications necessary for a job, she, like you said, uh, she feels like she has to check every single box. And yet, I'm comfortable even if I check only most of the boxes. And I'll mm -hmm. on that. Um, and explain why I can handle the rest. But what can I do to get her to feel more self-assertive to take those risks when she does, when, you know, when she doesn't feel, completely fill somebody else's checklist? Okay. Yeah. So the question is, you know, if you have someone uh, that you're working that with with your wife in this particular instance who isn't meeting all of the qualifications for the job and feeling you know not confident enough to apply for the job, um, I would definitely, you know, it could have been written differently in the job description. That's why when I talk about it, it's from a hiring manager perspective. Try to write it in there. These are the things we like. You don't need to have all of these things. So as a hiring manager, that's what you can do. But as far as encouraging someone who's a candidate to apply, um, you can let them know that this is standard practice, that there isn't going to be a perfect person. No one is perfect and no one is ever going to fit an exact description. Really, that's a guide. And just um, inform them and educate them that that's industry practice. So that's one thing that you can do. Um, you know, I didn't say it earlier, but clearly, you know, I, as I said, I wasn't focusing on women in this talk, but confidence is key. So if you don't have confidence, it's going to be really hard to succeed. So you need those sponsors, mentors, and allies. You need to network to help build up your confidence and your network. Um, so it's really hard to do that kind of in a vacuum, you know, in your home environment, especially if you're trying to get back to work and you're not working. It's hard to get that confidence and self-esteem from, you know, the workplace, which is, you know, obviously a place where it can be received if you're in a supportive work environment. Um, but go out and network and, and try to build that uh, system up. So it's a great way to find a job is actually networking or referrals through somebody that you know. Um, so look look for ways to build confidence. I mean, that's you know some, something I recommend. So that's through networking. It's through you know volunteering. It's um, through go, putting yourself out there and taking a risk and doing something that makes you a little bit uncomfortable sometimes. Okay. Yes. Hi, I just wanted to volunteer my experience as being the oldest person who was also female at a startup a couple of years ago. And it was really interesting. I and this other guy were hired um, about the same time. It's like my third week on the job and I'm, I'm walking on the I'm walking near the little kitchen area and these two guys <laughs> are talking to each other. One's in his 30s, one's in his 20s. And the 30-something guy's like going, he's talking to his buddy and then he's going to the refrigerator and he turns to me, I'm six fucking feet away, and says, do you know where the cream cheese is? And I say, no, no idea. He does not ask with his buddy. And then he's like, oh, maybe they froze it. He Pulls it out the freezer and says, what's the best way of defrosting cream cheese? And I look at him, and there's no filter between my brain and my mouth at that moment. And I say, are you asking me, pretty much at this level, are you asking me because I have ovaries? I have no idea how to defrost cream cheese. I didn't even know you could freeze cream cheese. Do not ask me about cream cheese. 
And his buddy is doubled over laughing. And then when he stops laughing, he says, you're acting like that woman in Copenhagen when I opened the door to let her go in. And she said, I can open the door myself. OK, so I'm just going to tell you, A, I do not believe that those are parallel experiences. <laughs> and B, that was not a particularly welcoming place for me to work. So as an old, I've got that against me. And as someone with ovaries, I have that against yeah. me. So I think unless the men in this room and in other rooms step up to support women, and unless white people step up to support people of color, mm -hmm. and unless able-bodied people step up to support people who are not able-bodied, our fucked situation will continue to be fucked. Thank you so much yes. for being here. Sorry <laughs> that I got Oh, well, thank you for coming to the presentation and thank you for sharing. I mean, that plays in perfectly into my slide about, you know, the leaky pipeline and getting people to stay is the environment in technology can be very uncomfortable. It can be. And the fact that so many people come to me about wanting to change it is a good sign, but not everyone does want to change it. Maybe in your situation you had the case of some certain you know, employees that didn't want to change it, but there are a lot of people out there who do want to change it and who want to you know, actually take that step into action of not just talking about it. Because that's often you know, when I go to conferences and it's discussed, um, oh, lamenting the fact that there aren't any women here. Well, that's actually not going to change anything, just talking about it. So actually making some steps to change the work environment can, you know, can actually make a difference and actually changing the behaviors of certain people and, and the actions that they take. So situations that you run into where people would know that that's not appropriate behavior and that there would be consequences if it happens because even if people do know it's inappropriate, they're still doing it because there isn't any consequence for it. Did you have a question? Yeah, we're talking about this leaky pipeline. And is there something that you would want to convey to um, young engineers, female engineers, and male engineers mm -hmm. about the industry that you had misperceptions of before you went into the industry? And when you, mm -hmm. when you went into the industry, you discovered that these things were, were uh, problems that you hadn't realized before. Yeah. Well, I think when I went into it, I didn't realize that um, there was that it, I really did think it was a meritocracy. So I think that's a big misconception. So that's tech is put out there as it's a meritocracy. Um, so I think that was my biggest misconception was that I thought, and oftentimes that is the response that I get is, oh, well, just focus on the work, which, you know, is great. Like I said, you have to be exceptional at your job. You have to be doing the exceptional work every single day. You can't get anywhere without that. But the fact is that there are other things, especially as a woman, that you have to focus on and to be aware of those things. Because if you're not focusing on those things, you're, you're either hurting yourself or you're just staying in the same place. So just to survive, it's necessary to do things like build out that ne network. So get a sponsor, participate in mentoring, um, look at ways that you can increase your influence across the organization because that goes into the self-promotion. So unless you're participating in that, you're really not going to be able to expand and grow your career. So, so one of the problems uh, is that we have cultural biases. Mm -hmm. Obviously, with gender biases. Yes. Have you seen any companies that have decided to do something structural in order to ameliorate the effect of this bias? My, for instance, my ex-wife consistently made 25 to 50 percent less than her her compatible coworker. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they were less skilled than she was by far, uh, but they were still you know, the same level of engineering. Yeah. Is there anything that, that you can suggest that that might be offered to a company to say that look, we acknowledge this bias and we want to make sure that people have their incentives aligned in order to reduce the bias? Yeah, reducing that. Overcome the cultural effects. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, reducing the bias. You know, you, sp you spoke to a lot of things there in your question. So the gender, the gender pay gap, for one thing, the cultural bias. Um, so, you know, the, in the pay gap, you know, clearly, you know, that's the published numbers state that women are earning less than men in tech jobs. Um, I think that is one of my points was, you know, normalizing that negotiation. What I have seen some companies do is being transparent with their salaries. So I think that's, you know, something that could be effective. I've heard of some companies, you know, just kind of eliminating that negotiation aspect. So doing, you know, just straight, you know, everyone makes a similar salary. I, I think it's too soon to say whether or not that's going to work. I think it is nice to have that incentive to be able to negotiate your salary and, you know, have a range. So you're going to have people performing differently at different um, points in their career doing the same job so it's nice to be able to reward that you know as a manager you know just paying someone the same thing regardless of what they do it seems like it takes a away a little bit of the incentives there so I'm not sure about that but those are a couple things that I've, I've seen done and then of course you know there is kind of this push across many technology companies uh, diversity so hiring heads of diversity again I think it's a little too early to say if that's having an impact I do know you know focusing on diversity unfortunately often has the opposite effect. So when you actually try to focus on being diverse and hiring people of diverse backgrounds, it actually can have the reverse effect, which is why one of my points is, well, just try to focus on being human, right? Try not tr trying to look for things that are different about people, but kind of having kind of taking away that, you know, blind interviews, I guess, are one thing that I've seen done. So when you have people coming in and not knowing whether um, this person is from, you know, a certain area, whether they're man, whether they're woman, you know, whatever, those kinds of things. Um, but again, just this week, I saw maybe that that wasn't being as effective. So I think there's different things being tried and experimented with. Um, I, I don't have, you know, a shining example or case study of what some people are doing that's working. I know a lot of people are doing unconscious bias training, which again, I think is helpful, but I, and things like forcing people to hire certain people, I don't think works. So you didn't ask me what doesn't work, but I would say, you know, forcing people to do things is going to create resentment and and, you know backlash against it so I think it really does have to come from within and be encouraged and normalized as something that we want to see happen and you know giving people quotas and forcing things on them I think is from the experience that I've had people react very negatively to it so it's a very difficult problem to solve um, but I think trying to encourage norms and education is a first step and then getting the men to actually participate and make actions as allies and um, participating and speaking up and actually physically doing some of the things that I suggested will make a little bit of a difference. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So your question is about burnout. So you worked in a situation where there were a lot of women experiencing burnout. So and turnover within the the roles because of that burnout. Um, well, tr you know, clearly, you know, <laughs> that's hard to combat. But one of the things that you can try to offer, and what I've taken advantage of in my career, is flexibility and work from home. So I have a flexibility in my schedule, um, and I also work from home. So being able to offer those types of advantages can be helpful. Um, so you can take advantage of those and not punishing people for taking those. So that's the other thing. So um, I found that to be helpful. And then of course, you know, <laughs> it has to come from, like you said, establishing boundaries. So people have to feel confident enough in their role that they can establish a boundary, that they don't have to say yes to everything because that actually isn't gonna get you anywhere. By doing everything, you won't 
and trying to do everything well, you're not going to do anything well. So you really need, you know, as a woman to be able to set those boundaries and stick with them and be confident that you can do that and you're going to be delivering the value in your core competencies. So that's what I would suggest in that situation. Yes. Are you from the Valley? I'm so sorry. I'm okay. Well, I am local, so I work at Oracle, and um, I worked at Sun Microsystems before that. So um, I worked at Sun Microsystems in Cupertino. I started at Sun in 2000, so yes, I am local. Um, I work from home, so I'm based Santa Clara and Redwood Shores, but I work from home, and I do travel quite a bit um, for my job at Oracle. I work with the Java community, so I travel around the world, um, usually at conferences, so Europe, Africa, Asia, South America, as well as sometimes in North America. But today I'm home, so I drove here today and I'm not staying in a hotel. So this is actually a very unique thing other than Java One in San Francisco every year. That's my only other local conference that I normally do. Well, that's incredibly generous, your contribution of time. I just wondered if you had a perspective on um, I, I, I feel as though the, the tech community's culture, the Silicon Valley culture, the tech startup worship, this is a service to basically all its employees. You know, it's like the, the myths of, like, I was at Yahoo years ago so that they could point out to me, like, the cubicle where Jerry Yang used to sleep <laughs> under, under it in his sleeping bag and stuff. And there's a way in which you know, it's super useful to employers to make us all believe that the most important thing is for us to conflate our lives and our jobs, but it's actually in disservice to us as human beings not to actually have more in our lives than our jobs. Um, I remember I got pushback once from my boss when I let somebody who reported to me leave early on Wednesdays so he could go pick up his daughter from Mm -hmm. And he was like, you know, nobody else gets to do that, that's not okay. And I was like, dude, he's the single best editor we have in this place. I am absolutely letting him go mm -hmm. on Wednesdays. But that whole thing about, we all have to work all the time, because otherwise we're useless. And, and our only value is the value we have to the company. So clearly, I have opinions and feels about this. Yes. But I don't know. But you've also, you've been working, it sounds like, at established companies rather than at the, some of the more crazy startup culture. So I don't know how much you can explain yeah. that or what your take is on that, but I'm curious. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, I think the culture does demand that. That is quite pervasive, you know, that work engulf your life. Um, I do work with quite a few startups. So I work, I work in the Java community. So there are m many startups participating in the Java community through my role. So I am aware that that does go on. Um, and, you know, Frankly, that's why I've never gone to work for a startup. Um, but I often do hear you know, them asking about being able to offer that balance, so wanting to be able to offer that, but especially in the last couple years, I've seen a shift away from that, so a shift back to that type of culture that you're talking about, where you need to be in the office every day. You know, if you're, if you're absent from your um, open workspace, which is what you see most of the time now in um, s startups, is an open workspace, and you know, needing to see you in that space every day and you know wondering where you are if you aren't there and questioning your commitment to it. So I think that that is pervasive throughout Silicon Valley. Um, I think it might be less in other places from what I've seen, although I think it is kind of a worldwide trend now to bring people back to the office, which is unfortunate because it does offer that a little bit of extra flexibility to employees and kind of give that them that extra benefit, which can be a great benefit for a tech career is that you're not a doctor you don't have to be in the hospital you know you can have different hours you're working with people all over the world you can be doing your work at 4 a.m. your time and it's someone else's work day which you know that's how it is for me in my role working with people internationally and so I haven't for me it matters less for some roles it may need need to be for tech that you need to be in the office but there are so many roles in tech where that isn't 
a requirement to get your job done and be excellent at your job. So I think that that is something that has become more problematic these days, but I also hear from companies that they want to offer that flex time to employees too and work with them. So I think it's it's really a one-to-one, one-on-one -one kind of thing. It's a case-by-case -case basis. I can say, you know, that I, I see that across my organization that it really does kind of differ based on the, the management chain that you're in. So what they value in terms of being able to honor people who want to have that flexibility and work alternate hours or have a flexible work week. So it can be done, but you really have to take it all. It has to go up to you know that person's line of business and see what their values are and how they perceive it. So I think it's a problem as you have stated. Job as these days to have benefit. Yes. Well, have been dinner in the cafeteria, yes. So. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming to the talk again. I appreciate your participation. I'll be around and we can talk more. <laughs> okay. All right.